what you are bringing up is not relevant. It has everything to do They're with it. They're not on the same it principle. Let's let people talk for like at least 15 minutes. But when I want to talk, I get interrupted. So no, we're not going to do that. You're interrupting everyone too. Yes, let's have no uninterrupted. I just want this question answered. This is the 114th episode of Middle Ground, and we want you to help us decide what the next 114 episodes will be. Join our Middle Ground Patreon community and make Middle Ground with us. The other side is brainwashed. Can the agreeers please step forward? I think brainwash is a strong word, but I also obviously step forward. I was raised Muslim, mm. I'm Iranian. My mom's side of the family, especially a lot of Iranians, they felt like they just had to become Muslim to obviously like adhere. And it's extreme what they're doing in Iran, obviously I'm not comparing, but I guess with brainwash, I also went to an Islamic school. So my really devout Muslim friends, it feels like brainwash. I have a friend who's hijabi and I, I just like, it, for her, it feels like it wasn't a choice kind of vibe. It's just something you should do because of your family and because of the religion. But then she's also super devout Muslim. It's just a hairy topic. Can the disagreeers please step forward? Yeah, I mean, I would agree in the fact that brainwash is a very strong word, just like you said, um, yet you still step forward. Um, I'm not familiar with anyone on this set, so for me to call someone that I don't know brainwashed, I would feel that it's pretty disrespectful especially not knowing where they came from, what their beliefs are, why their lifestyle is the way that it is. Um, so I don't really see how that kind of goes together. I just think any kind of uh, philosophy that doesn't encourage you to ask questions, to challenge it, to you know, seek further truth, I, I, I think that should automatically kind of be a a little bit of a red flag uh, to kind of say this is the one truth and everybody else might be uh, getting maybe closer or further from the truth. Um, so while I like see where you're coming from, I don't agree that people are brainwashed because I do not want to disrespect your experience. I think it may seem a certain way, but it might not be the truth for everybody. And I also want to touch up on like you talked about how um, you can't question something. I think for me, for years, I like really struggled with my faith. Like I, I don't remember being a child and like praying because I have to pray, but praying because like I felt like there were repercussions that I would have to face if I didn't pray. And it wasn't until I got to leave my house and go to college and like experience Islam on my own that I had a good association with it. But I also believe that Islam is one of the religions that does encourage like questioning like it says if you have doubts I will have answers uh, I just wanted to make a note I this is my mate and maybe it's my personal experience growing up Muslim and I went to an Islamic Academy I was hijabi after fourth grade years you have to be um, and I had religion class every day and I will just say I feel like every question I had is met with because the Quran says so that's it like I date someone who's not it has no background in Islam or didn't grow up that way you're gonna get met with because the Quran says so, because Allah deems it so, and it, that is why. The reason that I disagree that the other side is brainwashed is because I think first, the other side to be brainwashed, there would have to be one specific truth, one version of Islam that no one can question and everyone accepts as the truth. I think that one truth doesn't exist and that different people believe in different versions of Islam. So because a lot of Muslims, including Muslim scholars, have been coming to different interpretations and if you were brainwashed you would be un you would not be able to come to that difference of opinion you would simply follow what the, the scholars of the past said hi i'm jade and i'm a member of the middle ground patreon and i was chosen to read the next prompt women and men are equal in the eyes of allah I think a lot of people misconstrue about Islam and when they say that women are 
mistreated in Islam. It just comes from the fact that men and women were created for different purposes. Now that doesn't mean that one holds more value than the other and that one is seen as better. As an atheist um, now, I, I still uh, hold that uh, Islam does come from a feminist place. Um, you see uh, women in positions of leadership. So uh, despite you know my being on this side, I, I still um, appreciate that Islam has uh, that perspective. I grew up overseas. I grew up in Bangladesh and growing up in a country that seemed like a lot of things are not fair for women. A lot of things are not fair for minorities. Um, and I think I struggled with that thought like, okay, if men and women are equal in the eyes of Allah, then why does this exist? And what I realized as I grew older was that we're also living in a society. So I definitely have to face the repercussions of like other people and the social construct that we have, right? The systems but, outside of it. Yeah, the system outside of it. So like our experiences are a product of like what we believe in. Exactly. And but also like our position within the system. And I, I won't put the fact that like society sees women as not equal onto God and onto my religion because that's not what religion was meant to be. And I'm not going to say that Islam does not believe that women and men are not equal. This was one of the biggest topics that caused me to really doubt my faith. Looking at the Quran, looking at the authentic hadith, and also just from historical records as well. Men are allowed to have sex with female slaves. In Surah Nisa, verse 24, it says, prohibited to men are married women except for what your right hand possesses. And your right hand possessions refers to female slaves. And we see multiple hadith of instances where the men have just defeated the tribe, they have female war captives, and Muhammad allowed them to have sex with them. And that's probably going to be rape because what woman would be consenting to sex in that situation? I think too, like just thinking about the Quran and my upbringing, like I had every day, the two biggest ones that come out stand out to me would be like the issue of the hijab, which I know a lot of people will counter. So the Quran says women have to cover the khaymar to cover up so that they don't tempt um, the men. And then the, I will say the Quran does technically say men's hijab is their gaze, the male gaze. And I just, it just seems a little silly to me beyond that, like in the Quran, how men can have up to four wives, but women can't. It's like, I, or I, in the Islamic school, I want to say the, the azan, the call to prayer. All the boys in my class, they're like, we're going to do the call to prayer for fr this Friday. Um, I'm ineligible because I'm a woman, apparently. Can't do the azan, I can't do the call to prayer. So just those, are, I would say, are my Quran-specific examples. And they're like, well, this is to protect women. I don't see that at all. Yeah, so there's a lot of different points that you brought up. The first one being the hijab, which the woman is obligated to wear. And you talked about how the men have to lower their gaze, which is 100% right. The women also have to lower their gaze, and the men actually have their own hijab. So the men have their own parts of their body that needs to be covered as well. So obviously, men and women were created um, both physically different and psychologically, all different types of, they're different in every single way. There's different parts of the body that need to be covered because men are attracted to different things, women are attracted to different things, and it's to protect both sides. The second thing that you brought up, I believe you mentioned the, you not being able to make the call to prayer. Um, once again, that's in order to protect the women just because men can also be attracted to the voice of a woman. So that's the reason that that's not allowed. And I completely understand that you being a young child, that's something that you wanted to do. I mean, pre-puberty, um, in your household, when, with, your, with your family, that's something that you should feel free to practice, make the call to prayer, do that in front of your father, your brothers, your uncles, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be in front of the whole entire mosque. So there may be things that you felt because you were a woman you were being limited to, but there's a benefit behind it. So it's about looking into that. I think this is bringing up an important, important point of contention here with all the things that you're saying and you keep bringing up that men and women are fundamentally different. Where is that coming from? Can Where I is ask what that? coming from? When you say those things. When I say what? Men and women are fundamentally different in these very specific ways. Men are attracted <laughs> to a woman's voice. Okay, so scientifically, uh, men and women are different. So if you were just I look at someone, man, and I look at a woman, I'm pretty sure I would see some differences um, as well as just scientifically, biologically, Emotionally, psychologically, there's been studies because everyone started to question you being able to change your sex and be able to change your gender, but you were created as a certain sex for a reason. And each- I would, so that's my point of contention here. I, there's nothing, there's nothing for me there. When you say that I was created for a specific purpose and a woman was created for a specific purpose, I would disagree completely. Why can't I fulfill those other purposes? When you start 
slowly building upon these layers, these layers of like roles that that prescriptive prescriptive roles that starts to create a system of oppression. Yeah, well, in order that's for how it's built. Well, can Beautiful. I say for personally myself? Um, I, I would say that his view of it is also an interpretation as much as there's merit to it. Covering my hair and my face for me was so that people see my personality and my intellect before they see my beauty okay. or they see the things that they're attracted to. Yeah. Also in my culture, I'm ethnically black, obviously. Um, well, maybe not obviously. But, um, <laughs> our hair is very different from other races and we go to great lengths to assimilate. And that was something that I personally struggled with before converting. So for me, yeah, um, it just, it helped me gain confidence. I would be worried about like, am I, how does my face look? Is there something on my face? Or some of your communication is also in your facial expression. So when you can't see some of it, you have to kind of, you know, use your imagination a little bit. I like that mysteriousness. I like that, especially other men don't have that access because I'm, I have a fiance. I like that there's only one person who can see these parts of me. Um, and it, that's what makes it special in a way. So the roles for men and women, it's not entirely just because I want you to do it because I said so. It's probably because it's to your benefit. If you look yeah, further. I want to add to your point that Allah actually says in the Quran that like there's no compulsion in religion. So when you say that, why can't I do X, Y, Z? Like, why can't I do the other role, for example, right? These are the things that, because Allah expects you to, these are the things best for you, but it's not that you can't do these things. But when you say it's best for me, mm -hmm. there's a threat. The, the problem yeah. is there's always gonna be an existential threat. Saying it's best for you because it's what's best for society. So everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in place for us, that we believe God, the reason that we have these specific, if you want to say roles, because men complement women in a certain way and women complement men in a certain but, but way. But what I'm saying is he's not, when let you me, say let me, that Let me though, explain myself, all right? Let me give you a very easy way to understand that. I'll use her point, right? So you mentioned that, for example, why can you not marry four husbands and why can I marry four wives, right? These things have less to do with equality or worthiness in the eyes of Allah and just individual sex differences. For example, if I have four wives, right? I can impregnate all of them and we'll all know who the father is and who the mother is. If you, for example, in this scenario, you have four husbands, we won't actually know who the father is. And also, why, just why? why is that why? important? Why would that happen? And why how does that make men and women equal in the eyes of Allah? Like, that's, that's what that's telling so you. So I'm saying we're equal, but we're different. Th th there's no knowing of the and father. And that's just there. reducing women to the sole purpose of, of reproduction. I and don't think it's that. Men you know, you can impregnate someone every day. And women, you know, we kind of have to stay pregnant for a while and I feel like there would be like a mix up with- Paternity issues. I understand issues. what you're saying. Like, like genetics, like, like if it was just one, one man impregnating <clears throat> a bunch of women, you could have a society still. I understand so what me, you're saying, but these are such narrow, like, whataboutisms. These are such yeah. narrow circumstances. So let me, let me ask you a question. No, but, but I, I want to I'm sorry, in. I want to hear from Atia and Janet as well. Yeah. I think, um, also, here's just a food for thought, and I, already, I can guess the answer. Why don't y'all wear a hijab? Like, why, why, why can't men wear a hijab? They are. So I'm currently in hijab, right? But so I mean on your head. You have heads, women have heads. So you consider gotcha. that, you're, you're basically calling that hijab a headscarf. That's not that's what a hijab is. Yeah. Yeah, I, so. okay, I mean, so, And once again, I, we already said that the hijab for men and women is different because we're both created physically different. So obviously the hijab for both of them is gonna be that different. That statement is not really And then once again, you're implying that the hijab is oppressive to women. So. That's what you're implying when you're saying that why can't men do it because are you do you believe that the hijab is oppressive to women uh but uh, in the deepest depths of my soul yes i understand okay. it can so be a choice i you, do believe it's oppressive. by you agreeing that or by you saying that the hijab is oppressive to women that's actually disrespectful to our women in the religion because you're either implying that these women can't think for themselves and that they're just wearing this hijab because they're that's they have not no, what they have i mean at all no i think or you're saying that we're all forcing every single woman in the religion to wear this and we're Throwing this on their head. No, 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 I, I, think, I think we need to acknowledge how easy no, I'm saying that's what you're, yeah. that's, that's what you're by, by saying that the women are being oppressed in the religion, that's because they have to wear the hijab. That's not black that's, and white. Can like I jump in, in here and ask? So these justifications that we are seeing for hijab, do these justifications really still have solid ground when we consider that the hijab was for only one class of women, free women? Slave women didn't wear hijab, and because men were allowed to have sex with, uh, with slave women, they were being sexualized and objectified when Muslim men were considering whether they're gonna purchase them. Yeah, let me answer that. So 
to address your slavery point, I'll get on that in a sec, all right? But the point that you're asking, if we are really equal, how could that be? And you were asking if we all had hijab, why do you have to cover your head with a khimar and I don't, right? A very simple example is if I expect a man and a woman to lift a heavy load, but the same load, that would be an equal, right? So we have to look at it as equality or equity. So what is equal in the eyes of Allah for a man is not going to be the same treatment for a woman. And I'm sure we understand that if there are differences in our sex, then there has to be difference in expectations and roles. Maybe historically, but we live in a time where a lot of what you're saying just isn't relevant. So you know, I'm not going to be found in a situation. Thank you. Um, I would love to wrap this up and I would love it if the women would wrap it up. I will say I feel like it's very rooted in when it comes to covering up, for example, it's to protect you. And if you are dressed immodestly, they might react a certain way. They're attracted to your voice. I just have to say, I am a lesbian, and I am not tempted by, like, in my mind, I don't see a woman walking down the street immodestly, and it's not rooted in equality. Like the prompt said, Allah sees both when men and women as equal, and I don't hear that, honestly, at all. And when you're Some saying, things I mean, you're okay, saying. Pause. Pause. thank you. Yeah, I, I would love to speak about. for the whole time. I'm yeah. so, I, we, we're going to keep going. Yeah. All of this is going to build on each other. I would really love to hear from Atiya. Okay, thank you so much, guys. There are a couple points I want to touch up on. I really like appreciate the uncomfortable things that you brought up in this conversation, and I loved how like a lot of you guys didn't respond. I couldn't respond myself. Um, and then like she brought up a point, and then everyone kind of jumped onto that because that is something you guys could respond to. Um, and I think like there are uncomfortable things that like especially us as women like have questioned um, that a lot of times don't get answered. And then I also want to say like you brought up a point or we we're talking about like, oh, you are that she's what she said was like disrespect, disrespectful to Muslim women. That's not true because women around the world have different experiences. There are women who are being forced to wear the hijab. You can't Absolutely. disregard somebody's life experience and be like, no, you don't live in that social area. You could live like this. When you're part of a system that you don't have that same level of like openness to, it's hard to be like, it, it's hard to see that, you know? Mm -hmm. It is impossible to live a 100% pure Islamic life in modern society. Join our middle ground Patreon to watch this exclusive prompt. I have lost relationships because of my current religious beliefs. <clears throat> the relationships that I've lost would be relationships that I probably should have been in in the first place. Once I became more strong in my faith, I had to cut those people off. So those are the only relationships that I've lost. Yes, it hurt maybe at the time, but I look at it from the outside perspective. It was the decision that I had to make. A relationship that I've lost is in a different sense than losing contact with them, but I, the relationship I lost with them is that I'm unable to be my true self around them. And that relationship is with my mother, and it's the reason why I'm in this ridiculous outfit today. Because if my mother ever found out that her only child is going to go to hell forever because he left Islam, it's going to hurt her so badly. I saw myself how much it hurt my mom when I was talking openly about my uh, doubts in Islam in high school. It was causing her like literal depression. The reason I continue to pretend and I, like, I don't really have the bravery to come out and be my true self around her is because she's the best mom I could have ever asked for. She did, she worked so hard to raise me. She sacrificed so much to give me a really happy childhood. And the idea that I will be showing her that all her hard work was for nothing because her child is going to burn in hell forever, I can't hurt her like that again, like I hurt her in the past. She doesn't deserve to be hurt. She deserves to be happy. I would say I haven't lost any relationships as far as like dating. And I am no contact with my family, but it's actually not because of the difference in religion. It's because of a plethora of other things. Um, I would say I went to that Islamic academy growing up. And ironically, it was the best years of my life. I had the best friends. When I went to a secular school, I'm from a conservative area, so I was the only Iranian, so they were bullying me for being hairy. And then when I went to the Islamic Academy, I didn't have that problem anymore. It wasn't until when I went to high school and I'm like distancing myself from Islam that a lot of people from our local community um, just kind of, like there's whispers of, oh, Janet's family is hypocrites. She's a whore because I 
don't dress modestly, as modestly as they'd like me to, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've lost a lot of, I would say, my Muslim friends from the school. Thank you for sharing, guys. I also wanna say, I think I have a very similar experience with you. I would say that there were quite a few years of my life when I was really, really questioning my faith, but also like the way I grew up and what was like, I would say, forced upon me. Um, and it was really hard because I felt like not myself. Because of how conservative my family was, I, as I grew older, we just started becoming like separated because of their viewpoints. And as like, as they grew older, they became more and more religious. And to a point where I felt like sometimes, like if I'm trying to like share my feelings, something like that's really difficult. And I've gone through like very difficult situations in my life. Um, I've been met with like so many religious things. I felt like misunderstood by my siblings a lot when like when I was questioning my religion. I felt like I had to keep that secret. And it wasn't until end of my high school career where like I was sitting with my best friend who is very Muslim and one of the best people I've ever met. And I shared, she was like the first person I shared and it, it took so much courage to share that. And then she said, you're not horrible for questioning your religion, you're just human. And I think that changed my life. And I think that's what I would say to anyone that's like watching this video. I would say that to anybody who's like questioning, like you're just human, that does not make you bad. And like, especially if you're Muslim and you're like afraid of like what Allah thinks of you, Allah does not think of you badly. So I just think I'm in a, in a pretty privileged position. My dad's half Jewish, um, but baptized Catholic. My stepmom was raised Southern Baptist. I have Mormon cousins. I have Quaker uh, family. I've I've just had to all my life learn how to agree to disagree with with certain things um, and um, and just be sensitive um, uh, across beliefs, but that isn't to say I, I don't feel like I've lost some connection for sure with my really devout Muslim family. Um, I I haven't told them that I'm queer. Um, my mother came out, she was married to a woman for, for, for a while, so, um, you know, they at least know that, but um, at least, you know, with the conservative part of my family, um, they've proven that they're not a safe space, and that's that. Um, I've lost some relationships because of me reverting. It's more so because people couldn't relate to me anymore, because I used to be very different. I used to be that girl who would like go to raves with my friends. Uh, my favorite rapper is Stunna Girl. Like I, I'm from Sacramento. <laughs> like I wasn't raised Muslim. So all the friends that I had growing up and stuff, when I started to become a little bit more conservative or a little bit more intentional with the things that I wanted out of life, they were kind of like, why don't you want to go with me to like, you know, clubbing or do this? And I'm like, because I want to have a family. Like I want to make sure that I'm the type of person that I would choose if I was a man. And I realized that um, when I became an adult. And so because of that, people, we just went our separate ways. Islamic views on homosexuality are outdated. So, I grew up in a pretty queer family. My South Asian family is very uh, Muslim, and my mother and her sisters grew up in that environment, um, and all three of them turned out to be queer. I'm queer, my sister's queer. It was a long journey of self-acceptance, and this is just who we are and who we've always been. When I, when I look at my grandfather, he and I, have strikingly similar stories. He admits that in his village, it was normal for men before they were married to play around with each other, to have boyfriends, um, uh, to experiment. But then after you were an adult, after you kind of, after you married, of course, that, that was off the table. But I, I kind of see, you know, almost 70 years apart, me and him both have the same stories. Early 20s, got to experiment with my sexuality, you know, now in a long-term relationship with a girl and, and very secure in that. But uh, his experience was filled with shame that, that he then passed on to his daughters. So uh, 
I just I, I see that and I feel bad for generations of, of queer people who have been uh, told that they can't be um, or that maybe they can be, but they can't act upon it because that is haram in some way. Um, so queerness is in our blood. It's in our nature. It's across species. It's across time. It's across history and uh, religion through Islam, through Christianity um, and through various other means um, have been used as, as tools to erase that queer history. I agree. All Abraham, all religion in general, organized religion. I feel like it's not you're going to find it in Christianity and Judaism. Um, I. I myself, I'm a lesbian. I didn't come out until I was older, like an adult. But a lot of that was rooted because I have such devout Muslim family. It's like, it's if I come out, like my mind's going many places. It's not just gonna be like a normal American family coming out. Like I have very abrasive Muslim dad. I don't really see my gayness coinciding with um, religion, like an organized religion. I think that Islam has no moral standing to say that two consenting queer adults can't be in love while allowing a man to have sexual relationships with his slave. I couldn't rationalize how that is okay, but two gay or lesbian or whatever adults who are in a loving relationship, they're fully consensual, there's no power dynamic, is, that's bad. My question is, if it's okay for two consenting, for example, males who have love for each other to conduct sexual intercourse, then what is the problem with um, two brothers who have love for each other and they're consenting to have sex that's with each other? That's not the same. How is that's it not the same? Incest and, you're comparing incest and homosexuality. That's, that's you're, so Please explain that's the difference. I'm not going to lie, explain that's the really difference. offensive. Either that's way, offensive. How, how, how either way, offensive. That's either way, very it's, offensive. It's explain the difference. Relevant. Explain the difference. It's very I could, relevant. I could because maybe. One is incest, morality. one is, I've done a 23 and me, me well, and my girlfriend are not related at all. Okay. So one is, well, well, what is the difference? Well, what is the difference? They're both consenting and they both love each other. Can I say something? Yes. That's as wrong as a brother and a sister consenting and having sex. Exactly. I agree. So what's the problem with that? What do you mean? So you're comparing incest homosexuality. Okay, because they both come from the same point. There's two oh, people they're... who consent to having sex together. It's yeah, the same exactly. exact thing. Yeah. So what's the difference? Is, if they love different scientifically... methods of socialization. Can what is the, pro what is the problem with them? Have, if they both consenting and they both have love for each other, <laughs> just like two males who don't know Hold each on, other have speak. love for each other, what is the problem? problem I just want to say, that? you just did this thing in public speaking called minimizing an issue. And then you're trying to find this correlation what that like, I'm simply doing does is not exist. addressing the principle, which is coming from objective morality. So I'm trying to figure there, out that's what I'm trying to figure yeah. out. Okay. Is if, if this is wrong, <laughs> if homosexuality is okay, then what makes incest not okay? That let me tell you. So, let, me, let me say what you are bringing up is not relevant. It is, not, is it not. It relevant? has nothing it's to not do. Not with it it has nothing to do Can with two men who are not related. It has everything to do. They're not on the same principle. Let's let people talk for like. But when I want to talk, I get interrupted. So no, we're not. Let her you're interrupting yeah, so everyone too. Yeah. So it's we're really offensive all, for you to make these on, arguments when you are we're constantly all Every time I speak, I'm getting interrupted. I let y'all speak every single time, and then, yes, and then I let's have no so one I just, I just want this question let's answered. Have, like, simply no put, one. what's wrong with two brothers? Can I answer, answer like, the question? So, yeah, please. Okay, so I feel like what, it's very obvious that incest is wrong because one, if you have a child with this person, there might be something wrong with it. Not to mention that. If somebody has known you since you were born, the influence that they'll have over your life is different than if you made the choice to actually right. be with them. Exactly. That's why it's wrong. Here's the thing about homosexuality, because you would think that I'm homophobic because, you know, like, I guess everybody assumes I'm like extra pious and whatever right, because right, I cover right. my face, right? Actually, one of my parents um, is a member of the LGBT community. I grew up with some cousins that were I had friends that were all throughout elementary school and high school and stuff. I never saw um, morally something wrong with it. I think that the reason that it was put into Quran it is simply about sustainability. You can't sustain life on earth if people, like the majority of the population are homosexual. I don't think it was to say that anybody's better than anybody else. We all have the capacity for love. We all just want to love and be loved. My question is, the idea that there's two consenting individuals that want to have sexual intercourse, 
regardless of their backgrounds, what is wrong with that? Because we don't, we're not saying that that's the only determiner here. We're saying between two men who have not grown up together, who are not brother or brother and brother. So th it's two different things. They are two different okay, things. Okay, so let's say there's two estranged brothers that never grew up together. My well, honest science. answer to you. Can we pause? I would like to hear, uh, Jad, you can make a final statement. I'd like to hear from Atia. Um, and can we keep it about homosexuality? So let's close up incest. You want to bring up the point about how incest results in, there's obviously things that come harm that can come from that. There's also harm that has been proven to come from homosexual intercourse and a man having what's, intercourse what's with another man. Uh, um, all the STDs. STDs yeah, of course, are rampant in heterosexual the STDs, 100 percent. But there's, right it's no been scientifically proven that STDs issues. are more yeah. in homosexual so relationships. Heterosexual people get STDs too. So your argument of that they homosexual do. people get do. more STDs, but homosexual people are that's getting why it's wrong? Creating, so there's new STDs that are resulting from this type of intercourse that's happening. And it's found a lot more in homosexual Can you give me an example of Yeah, perfect. So a very recent scientifically proven one was monkeypox. That the overwhelming oh literature from okay. that, that was, from that was gay people, literally you were skin saying skin uh, you were projecting a stereotype. It literally became a stereotype against gay men. How is scientific literature a stereotype? It it's was your what? What are you sor uh, so the peer sourcing reviewed, here? Because every the, you're you have clearly believed all of the Google articles about how it was only attributed to the gay community. That's my opinion. That's it. Monkeypox was ridiculous. Um. I, I really wish that this conversation was like a bit more about like the impact, the fact that it's sinful in Islam and like the effect that it has on like youth. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, I think that like, I firsthand know the experience and the hardship people go through when they l grow up in a community when they have never even heard of se uh, homosexuality. And then the first time they hear about it is disgust. The way our societies are structured we hate on the fact that they even exist. We don't want our children to be that. We don't want people in our communities to be around that. We don't want to allow people who are homosexual in our mosques. So I'm getting really emotional about this because there are just so many people I've seen. There are so many people who have lost their lives because they just could not exist. And so to minimize somebody's life and to like hate on them for this one part of their life that is so that's supposed to be so private is not okay and it's not Islamic. Um, Personally, I didn't step in here to say that it's outdated because I don't want to make a statement about my faith that I wasn't. This is something that I always struggled with, but I'm not going to say it's outdated because I just don't know why it is the way it is. And I choose not to question it because I'm a Muslim. But at the same time, I do have like a lot of pain associated with that, that truth uh, because I have seen how that impacts people's lives. Um, and I think that like at the end of the day, like. I wish we lived in a world where we saw the fact that like, as human beings, we have free will. Therefore, just how I have the free will to practice my religion and like not entertain a homosexual relationship the same way anybody else has the ability to not be religious, to practice homosexuality and to coexist respectfully. And that's something that sometimes Muslims can't offer. And that is my problem. Um, and I wish we offered that so that we wouldn't lose people's lives the way that we do. We wouldn't push people away. We wouldn't traumatize them and generations to come. Yeah, and I 100% agree with that. The fact that um, it's very important that we understand regardless of what Islamic points and my points obviously coming from Islam are on homosexuality, that that means that in no way whatsoever am I going to blatantly disrespect you for the way that you're living your life. Just because I deep down inside reject not even deep down, I <laughs> just get inside. I reject your lifestyle. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna come out here and start blatantly disrespecting you and saying anything about the way that you're living your life. If that's the way that you're gonna live your life, that's the way that you're gonna live your life. And at the end of the day, we believe that it's gonna be God that's gonna be the one judging you. And it's not up to me. Muslims are unfairly targeted by outsiders. So I'll just say this, this is an interesting. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to think for a really long time. <laughs> no, yeah, fair enough. Honestly, just being from the Middle East in general, you're going to get targeted. I went to a conservative secular school, and I was the only Iranian kid there. And they automatically just assume I'm Muslim because I'm Iranian. They have such like disdain for it. I've had um, in-laws from several people I dated, um, like as soon as they start dating me, send things about ISIS and the Taliban, like articles. And for, which is ridiculous because even as an ex-Muslim, I know that's not Islam. I'm pretty protective because of it, even as an ex-Muslim, like 
I, if I hear anything disparaging, I'll jump on it because I just feel like people are really Islamophobic. I agree, yeah. Islamophobia is real. I experienced it myself as a kid. And I know the topic was about outsiders, but I have actually noticed this issue with other ex-Muslims. Like some ex-Muslims, when they leave their faith, they become really Islamophobic and they become really dead set on this yeah. idea that Islam is, you're supposed to go and, and attack disbelievers. You're supposed to do jihad like ISIS and Al-Qaeda does. I mean, they contribute to how the outsiders would unfairly think that a lot of Muslims are uh, just terrorists that like they want to do jihad. But the truth is the most, the average Muslim today in America is a peaceful uh, person. Um, I just have one point to add. I really agree with this that like, especially in the United States, yes, we're definitely targeted. Um, even if you look like slightly Muslim, you're targeted. Even like being Muslim from a different sect of the world, a different part of the world, like gets you targeted. Um, a lot of times my dad, because I'm, we are South Asian, when we go out to like the Middle East, like anywhere in the Middle East, they attack him because they think that he is South Asian, um, even though he's like Muslim and they can see it and my mom's wearing a hijab. But I really agree with that. But at the same time, I also believe that there is another part of the truth that like there are places where there's violence occurring and Muslims are like, also part of that problem. Um, so in that case, they're also the people who are hurting others and also being hurt, and it's like a cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. I also like the point that you brought up. I think extremism is a problem, no matter which sector, whether that's like a extremist Muslim or an extremist from any religion. So I think that problem exists on both aisles. Um, I think y'all said it's pretty valid. I mean, it's not that I don't think Muslims get like unfairly targeted. I think just everyone gets targeted nowadays. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just like, yes, after 9-11, I think right after that, it definitely got a little bit tough for a lot of Muslims. I think it was like severe targeting at that time. Um, I think now, well, I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. Um, still every once in a while you'll experience something like maybe me because of my beard, like you'll get like a look or something or someone will just throw a comment. But it's nothing to the point where I'm like, I'm like hurt, like, oh my God, like, how could you say that? I just want to add, I think it's a little different for students who, like, kids who are in school. I tutor a lot of them. Um, I've had, like, students who have told me, like, even, like, the past year, like, how they have had, they, are, they were discriminated against. Um, and so I would say that, like, I think it still exists. Yeah, what I found for the most part is, it, it, it definitely, like, even when I was in school, like, yeah, I got made fun of or whatever, people would do jokes that, like, terrorist jokes or whatever. But once you, I just, like, I was the type of person, I wouldn't just sit down and, like, let someone make that joke about me. Someone made this exact joke in school and, like, uh, about, like, a bomb blowing up or something because we were watching a documentary. And so I, in front of the whole class, I addressed them. I addressed the reason, why did you make that joke? I explained my point of view and, like, and then he got expelled. <laughs> so <laughs> I think if you just let them make these jokes about you and you just sit back and kind of take it, then, yeah, the bully's just going to keep on attacking that. You definitely handled that situation better than I did <laughs> as a kid because in an elementary school, someone called me in PE class. He called me a terrorist. I said, if I was a terrorist, you would be dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened was I got a one-day suspension while he got a lunch uh, detention. I think, I think it's important to note, like, while I think there's definitely some validity in what you're saying for sure, like, it's important to stand up for yourself, for your beliefs, for your religion. Um, I don't, I think we need to acknowledge that it's not always that easy. And there's definitely yeah. circumstances 100%. where I think the opposite is true. I think there's just as much true that like somebody can go through their life and it will get worse for them because even so early on, we're talking about times like we, we were young children and we were exposed to these yeah. horrible pejorative things. And um, maybe those people have circumstances where when they go through life, it's just going to get worse. They're just going to, they're going to have even more hatred. They're going to, there's going to be more reasons for them to come at it in a way that's dangerous. My personal desires do not have a place in Islamic faith. For me, other than like the obvious, I'm part of the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. I was raised Muslim and I felt like I didn't have decisions or choices growing up. And when it came to Islam, I remember I questioned things in my religion class. I remember like the Imam told me like women, when you go to Hajj, you can't wear um, like body spray, right? Or perfume. And I raised my hand during um, my religious class and I asked why. And I always got met with, well, because the Quran says so, like, be quiet, Janet's the problematic kid asking me questions. Um, I just feel like 
there's no room really there even without the LGBT community part of me. Like what you want kind of, it felt like doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There's no room for it. It's just, it is what it is and you need to obey it. At the end of the day, if you commit a sin and you don't seek repentance, you're, Allah is going to punish you for it, even if your personal desires conflict with that. Because of that looming threat, it does not matter what you want. If it goes against what Allah says, then you are risking having your bones crushed in the grave, or you are risking having your skin burned off of your face. It doesn't matter how illogical you think it is. If you believe in Islam and Allah says it's bad and you go against that, you are putting yourself in a huge risk of a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah, I think it's not that it doesn't have room for our desires, because it does. It just doesn't have room for our compulsions. And I heard this quote, someone said, my religion is perfect, but I am not. You have to allow Islam to teach you that you've blurred the lines between your desires and your compulsions and the things that you actually need out of life. So it's really hard to be connected to God if you're connected to all these things that are calling you, pulling you different directions. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So does your standard for haram and halal vary at all? What would you base your standard off of? How were you taught those standards? Um, I learned them from Quran, Quran or from my upbringing, like if I don't know. So, oh yeah, yeah. So I think everything you're saying is valid and I think you can also believe all these things even just like outside of Islam. Like I think these principles have existed like throughout time, other religions, other philosophies. And so my question is like when it comes to the more sort of confusing, like I was raised, I'm not allowed to eat pork. Okay. So that's a... I'm sure, yeah, <laughs> nobody yeah. here. <laughs> Same. Right. And okay. so uh, I think at one point somebody told me that was because they're not safe to eat or like, you know, it's dirty. Point being, there are moments it, like you can you can definitely live your life that way. But my question is, like, at what point do you question those those nuances, those like those confusing yeah, well, points? First, first, I question why I'm questioning it. It's okay. like, why do I want to have a different answer than what's written here? First, I question that. Mm, okay. And then I'll do research and I'll say, okay, well, how were people living like before my time, before my parents, before my grandparents? And why didn't they choose to eat this animal? Well, maybe because it eats its own fecal matter or it mm -hmm. eats its children. I mean, you know, it's its okay. own fetus and stuff like right. that. Well, I understand what I'm saying is like, how do you deal with the the logic of it because yeah, so there's many ways to argue around it. If I yeah. can't inter is it okay if I interject here? Thank you. So essentially, yeah, there's a lot of things that you may not understand why something is not, essentially what you're saying is if something is not allowed and you don't understand why it's not allowed, how do you kind of go about being okay with this thing not being allowed? If God is telling us not to do something or to do something, even if we don't understand the wisdom behind it, it's the fact that we know that he's the most knowledgeable. So we trust in the fact that whatever he's telling us to do or not to do, that is the best thing for us. Blind faith. Blind loyalty. Yeah. So, blind so um, in terms of, yeah, this, because we believe that he is the most knowledgeable. So I do question, obviously, if something I don't understand something, I'll ask someone of more knowledge. And if they can't give me an answer as to why something is the way that it is, then we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet know what's best. And at that point, I believe put my faith in God. That's what faith is. I, 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 there's, there's just a, a, a small hiccup in both of your like scientific method here, which is that why am I questioning? And then, then there's your part. If I don't get the right answer or an answer that makes sense to me, I keep asking, I keep asking, I keep asking. But if you don't get it, then there's this kind of cognitive dissonance that yeah. now needs to exist. I think, I think, I think like a good way to put it is like part of existing as a human being is questioning everything. That's how we developed everything. That's how we grow and adapt. So I want to add something really quick. I know that like there has been a lot of questions about with what he said, especially you guys saying like that's blind faith. I think that there is like, I see your point, but there's a lot of merit. And like, I agree that like, meaning of life is questioning things. However, if you keep questioning everything, you're going to have the most doubtful, horrible, untrusting life in the entire universe. The, like the goal is, of life is to be in peace, right? So I think that like we can only question some of the things. And I think personally from my questioning, I have found the answers to which that has led me to trust the God that I believe in. And that is why I also believe in the other things that he, he tells me to subscribe to because I believe that that is good for me. So it's not always that every Muslim or anybody who subscribes to religion is like blindly believing in everything. No, they have 
a trusting relationship with that form of God or that religion or that ideology, and therefore they choose to subscribe to other ideals. Yeah. I totally relate. I, I there's a lot of insecurity here. Um, there's there's a lot of doubt. Um, there's a lot of thinking. I just I I think it is a much more difficult and much more noble path to take, uh, you know, through the chaos, through the unknown, um, through the lack of of prescription, through questioning, um, rather than just kind of taking the carrot and the stick of heaven and hell. And, and saying that that's, you know, those are my answers and, and that brings me comfort. I, I think that there are paths to being a good human um, outside of religion. And I believe earnestly that those paths are much harder to take. My question to you would be like, where do you draw the line? We all draw the line where our morality yeah, is. Yeah, I feel like there's like a general right. sense of no. How would it impact so, others usually? Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm saying if we were all left to just decide what is okay and what is not okay, do you guys not see that it would just be left to individual opinions? No, I think there's I think there's like a pretty basic understanding just as a human of what's right and wrong. Now, I'm just a really scientific person. I'm gonna right. re do my research. I have engineers for parents, so that gives me peace. Me it's, too. Yeah, so it's my different kind of peace. I don't think people are just atheists or non-religious people are running rampant without a set of rules. I think just to be a good person, religion aside, there's just pretty standard things that you should just follow. I see your point of view, and I think that that's why, like, like, what she said and what you said, like, I understand both of you so equally because I feel like at parts of my life, I struggled with feeling so much guilt. Like, I felt like Islam put so much, like, guilt on me of, like, oh, if I do this, I'm going to go to hell. I felt like a really anxious person. But then once I actually started becoming closer to God, I had a safer relationship with him uh, or them. Um, and I believed that, like, no, first, like, God is here for me. Like, there are so many times in my life I felt so alone. And like, when I read the Quran, like, I really feel that now that like, no matter who is hurting me, like, Allah is with me. And I think that has been like, something that has made me really strong. So I think that like, yes, people have a moral compass, but at the end of the day, like, as I know from my studies, like, it is dependent on culture. And if there was no like, guidance, people would still create one. That was a beautiful way to end. Thank you guys so much. It was nice meeting you all. Nice meeting you. Nice you. Loved this discussion. Okay. Very interesting. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir.